to talk to you about something that I think is uh, really slides really well off of our discipleship series that we've done. And I want to bring you a tool that I think is going to really help you to grow, uh, help you with that understanding of having less regrets in your life, lighter burdens, a fuller life. Who wouldn't want that, right? There is something that God does, and I want to kind of lay it out for you in a way that I hope can help you to say, okay, this is what I can take every day and I can uh, just apply it to my life and help me to get something that God has for me. Because I think sometimes we think this way when we're in the middle of hard stuff, we think that God's probably looking down and thinking, like, did anybody of you grow up with a parent that did an eye roll? Like, And, and just like that thing, that he's kind of looking down thinking, really? Like, that's your best? Or like, I don't think you're actually trying. And, or whatever version, or he's ready to squash you, or maybe even worse, he's just ignoring you. And uh, I think there's a way in which we see God that is completely anti-scriptural, but the Bible says that there's something else that he's doing. And uh, I want to kind of talk about it one way and then get to the core of what we're doing, is what he's actually doing rather than all those things, and rather than correcting you all the time, uh, wouldn't it be just horrible if every time you did something wrong, God was on you and correcting you? You would be a squashed bug, right? Because this is our life that we f- always fall short. Instead, what God does is he lays right paths in front of us and invites us to come to them. And that's actually how he works. Thank you for coming this morning. That's fantastic. You are allowed to participate in the service like that, if you'd like. I know it's like winter, and we're, but we can do this. And God puts these paths in front of us, and he says, here's how I'd like you to walk in it. And most of us have times where we struggle and we think that God is something else or someone else. Does he correct us? Yes, he does, of course. But most of the time what he's doing is he's calling us to better paths, the right paths, and that's how he walks you in. And here's the way that he does it more, I think, than anything else, is by asking you better questions. And I think if you think through your life, and we're going to take a a really quick survey through the Bible, you're going to realize, oh, I actually never thought of that before. But God is in the business of asking, like, killer questions. The things that cut right to the middle of it and to the core of it, and it started right in the beginning. Adam and Eve had a little apple problem, we'll call it. And then Jesus says, or God says, and he comes, and he used to walking with them, and he goes, who told you you were naked? Isn't that an exposing question? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, he just absolutely lays it all out. And there are questions that he asks throughout the Bible that are probing questions that that actually cut right to the core of what's going on. Elijah has expectations that weren't met. He thought there was going to be this huge revival. It turns out it's not. He gets depressed, like some of, like many of us do. Crawls into a cave, abandons himself, leaves all his friends behind, and God says to him, "Elijah, what are you doing here?" And really, what he's saying is, "Elijah, be honest." Be honest with yourself. Why are you here? It's like, oh, that's good. In your life, God is going to ask you questions. He's going to ask you better questions than the ones that you're going to ask yourself. And here's what I want to encourage you in, is I want to encourage you to engage in those questions because you can live your whole life just sort of on the surface and doing the thing and going to work and making it happen and going to school and hanging out, or you can engage with those better questions that God is always in the process of challenging you on. He's always got a better question for your life. In the first service, at the end, we're, we're going to let some time and speak to God. In the first service, the uh, little guy says, you know what? I, I was, I, we listened, and I said, you know why? God said to me, why are you getting, who are you getting your value from? And I was like, oh. And that was like the, whew, just got him. And he thought, Wow. I'm coming out as a Christian more, and I'm being more bold in my faith, and, and I'm surprised that I'm kind of, you know, feeling so terrible when people challenge me a little bit. And the answer to that question was God saying to him, okay, where do you really get your value from? You're seeing where this is going, right? 
God always has a better question for you and will you engage in it? And I wanna challenge you and push you to say that's where fuller life is, that's where you're gonna have less regrets when you look back, and that's gonna be the place where your burdens are gonna be lighter if you really engage in this process. You know, um, there are good questions and there are sort of bad questions. I remember when, as a while back, a while back I was in a season where in one perspective, I was looking at everything in my life and everything felt like it was heavy. Have you ever been there where it just feels like, oh, like can't something work out? It's relationships, and, and clearly some things were, but I was just thinking that way. It was relationship wasn't working out, significant one. Financially, stuff wasn't working out, and it just boom, 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 boom. And the, the question that I kind of came to God with that I mostly whined to him with is, why isn't this working? And why isn't this working was sort of, what's wrong with me? And what's wrong with you, right? That's really what was behind the why isn't this working? And I'm insignificant or you're not helping. Where are you, God? And uh, I remember the, the moment where, where God shifted it and, and it completely changed my thinking. And he said this, you need to ask the question, where is the upgrade that I am bringing to you through these circumstances? I was like, oh, oh, so you're, you're on a good path for me. Okay. And, and as it turned out, God was working in me in something that absolutely has been pivotal to the next season in my life. There are good questions. There are terrible questions. And there, and there are better questions that God has for you. And I want to uh, start off by just looking at the disciples when they, they first began. And uh, they were in that first phase of Jesus teaching them in John chapter 9. And Jesus said, you know, come along. And there, there's a healing of a man born blind that Jesus is walking. And he's coming in to do it. And the disciples say, who's fault is this that this man is blind? Is it his sin or is it his parents? And the reason why I start with this story is this, is I think right now in our society, we have a lot of blame questions going on. We have a lot of condemnation questions going on. We're looking at other people and we are trying to blame someone. And you know what? Here's what I want to say to you. As followers of Jesus, you are better than that. That is not the world that we live in. That is not a better question. And for us, we can fall into this trap so easy that the disciples fell into is blaming someone or something. And it's, you know what that is? It's being lazy. There is a way better question that God had. And basically what Jesus says to them is, eh, wrong answer, wrong question. You have to think through this. And he says, neither this man or his parents sinned. He was born blind so that the works of God might be revealed in him. There is something that God is up to that there's a question that God wants you to ask in the middle of whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is you're feeling, whatever it is that you're experiencing, that's a better question. And what I want to challenge you to do is engage it. Take your life and say, okay, I can do that way or I can go deeper and do this. So let's, let's take a look at, at something that I think is going to frame the first question that I want to talk to us about. And that is the story in John chapter 21. And what happened is Jesus has denied, Peter has denied Jesus. Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen again. But there is a period of time after Jesus rose that he showed himself to the disciples. But Peter, you remember what Peter did? He went back to fishing. Why did Peter go back to fishing? Because he had failed miserably over there and he just decided that's it, I'm out. And so he went back to the old thing. And he's, on the, he's in the fishing and he's doing this stuff and, and they didn't catch anything all night. And I know we don't get that, but in this, that society is if I don't catch something, I don't eat. 
So this was significant. And the, somebody on the shore yells to these guys. They said, hey, let down your net on the other side. And they're so tired. They said, fine, whatever. They throw their nets down and they catch 513 huge fish. And that net should have broken at 100. But God does this amazing miracle. He sustains this net. They, they're looking and all of a sudden Peter goes, Jesus! And he literally just leaps out. First, he put his clothes on. This is good. And he jumps into the water and he runs out to him. And it's sort of like that's his first response, right? It's like, Jesus. And he runs out and he meets him and he looks. And, and it's sort of the, mm, it's one of those scenes from the Bible where he looks and he sees that Jesus made a fire and he's already cooking some fish. Actually, Jesus doesn't need my fish, right? He's kind of got it under control. And Jesus sits down and has this conversation with Peter that is the most important conversation. It's the better question in Peter's life. And here's what it is. I'll read it from the scripture and then I want to kind of walk it through with you. And when they had finished eating, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more? Got it? That's Jesus' question to Peter. Do you love me more than these? This life, how you're living? Yes, Lord, he says, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, okay, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Hmm. He says, okay, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time and he said that he said, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. In your version of it, in the English, it doesn't quite come out. This is sort of how it should read. Jesus is saying to Peter, uh, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, sure. I'm your Facebook friend. He says, no, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? He goes, yeah, 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 I follow you on Twitter. He says, no, Peter, do you love me more than anything? He says, yeah, I love liking all your life, your stuff. It's fantastic. And, and there's this huge disconnect between what Jesus is saying, do you love me unconditionally? Will you love me more? And what Peter's saying, sure, I'm your friend. Why? You see, I, I think probably when that conversation was happening, I see Peter sitting around a fire and he actually can't look Jesus in the eye because all he can think of is that rooster that was crowing and how he failed. See, what he would have expected when he first saw that fire was that Jesus would come to him and the question that he would ask him would be, Peter, where were you when I needed you the most? Peter, where was that guy, that guy who said, everybody's going to abandon you, but not me? Peter, where was that guy? But Jesus doesn't say that, does he? Because Jesus actually wasn't looking back. He was looking forward because Peter was the guy who Jesus was going to take and he was going to make him, gonna give him the ability to preach a sermon that was going to start the church. He was going to be the guy that was going to be the rising force behind the church in, in Jerusalem. So Jesus didn't ask him those back questions. He asked him a forward question. And he said, Peter, do you love me more? Because Jesus wasn't looking at anything else other than his future. And here's what I want to encourage you in, in your life. God is asking you questions right now that are all about your future, that are about what he has for you, about how he sees you, about where you're going to go. Those are the better questions. Are you going to engage in those questions? Because there's lots you can look back on. There's lots of insignificant things in your life you can say, oh. <laughs> do you love me more? It's the perfect question that Peter needed if he was going to become everything that God wanted him to be. What's the question that God has for you? If it's a negative one, Ah, let's just put that aside. That's actually not God. 
if it's one that he's looking forward to you to say, I have something for you, engage with that. Do you love me more? I, I want to talk to you about what that actually looks like in our life and, and in our community because Peter started something, a community of Jesus that became, uh, uh, that changed the world, right? Everything that came out of that little breakfast around a fire actually started something that created a church that changed the world. And it was because Peter learned to love more. And, and folks, you and I, our call today is to do that same thing. And for some of you, this is the question. Your better question is, do I love you more? And that means how I connect with your family and how things happen. What does that love look like? You know, right from the beginning, God said, I have this idea of a, a family. And, and he started with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because that was connection. And then he said, I'm going to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden. And then he had a nation that he put together. He said, I want you to learn how to do this. And he took them out of slavery and he gave them the Ten Commandments. Why did he give them Ten Commandments? So they would all be holy? Yeah, sort of. So they would learn to live together and understand what, what it was really like to be God's people. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't covet your, your neighbor's wife. That's because, hey guys, we got to figure this out. Have you, have you figured this out so far? That being with people is kind of messy, right? It doesn't always work really well because you're you and I'm me and oh my. And God says, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. But this is my plan to change the world. And guys, for 2,000 years, that plan has changed the world. Do you love me more? It's so ridiculously simple. And it actually changed the world. It changed people's hearts so they loved other people more than they loved themselves. And they would go, when the last pandemics were on, would go into the cities when everybody else was rushing out and they would look after the dying, even if they got sick. Why do you think they did that? Because they love Jesus more. You think of that, you go, wow, man, God's smart, eh? Is he figured out a way to put a group of people together and gave them something that was so powerful that it was going to change the world. And it started with a little fire on the shores of a lake and looking into one man's eyes. And he said, do you love me more? And I think that's a great question for us. You see, like Moses came down the mountain, Jesus came down the mountain, and uh, he brought the Sermon on the Mount. And as he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, this was was what was going to change things. And I'm going to read that because I, I think we need to get this in order for us to really get what love really is. Now, you get the picture. Jesus has just appointed the 12 disciples, right? He's coming down the mountain. Moses came down the mountain. This is what, this is what love is going to look like. This is, what's, this is what changed the world. Okay? And he starts off with, the thing that I think, they think, this is like the worst. He said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you'll be filled. So we got poor and hungry. Uh, blessed are you who weep, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and cast you out as men of evil for the Son of Man's sake. So we got poor, hungry, weeping, and excluded. This seems like a terrible plan to me. And, and he goes on and he says, okay, those are the blessings, but then there's some, some woes here. He says, but woe to you who are rich, for you will be, you've received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger, uh, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now. And the laugh now is not like being joyful. Um, it would be like me saying to Derek, we play floor hockey, badly, apparently, lately. And I would say, <laughs> Derek, I'm a way better hockey player than you are. <laughs> it's like the gloaty thing, right? So he says, don't, that's what that is talking about. It's gloating. He says, those, those of you who gloat, 
uh, for you will mourn and you will weep. And woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers speak of the prophets. Is there anything in there at face value that you look and say, wow, that's like the blueprint for an amazing world-changing thing to happen? So we have to dig a little deeper. Uh, there's a, a chart coming up that I, I want to, I think this hopefully explains it for you. This was Jesus' radical idea for community. And this is what he said. I want you not to seek after. We're not masochists, right? But I want you to see the value in weakness, in sacrifice, in grief, and exclusion. Because if you can see the value in that, you can actually develop a community of people who care and love that are going to make a difference in the world. And the other thing that I want you to be wary of, I want you to really question this as being the basis of your life, is power, comfort, success, and recognition. And, and as you think about that, all of this, I think, can be a light bulb thing for you. What, there are things that you have learned in your life when, that you've, when you've been weak that there is no other place that you can learn it. And, and I'll say this scripture, you know it. When I am weak, he is strong. I am strong. That is what you can only learn when you are weak. When you're in a powerful place, you never learn that lesson. So God says, here's what I want you to do. You don't chase after being weak and horrible and pathetic. That's not the point. But what you do is you understand that there is, that weakness is a place in our church community that actually we can value. And when I can see somebody else who's struggling and they're weak, I actually have an answer for them beyond suck it up. You're welcome. I can say, hey, you know what? Here's the time when I was struggling with something the most, and here's what God did in me, through me, around me. And in fact, the thing that, that I most struggled with is actually the thing that God now uses me for to help other people. And all of a sudden, I see how God can take a community of people who really want to love him more, and they can say, ah, all of those things actually have value. I see what God is doing, and you are never going to get this in the world. There are, community, there are people all over the world who wanted to develop tight-knit communities, right? And some of them go off somewhere, some of them live in Wolseley, you know, whatever. <laughs> I have a son who lives in Wolseley. I think it's hilarious. Because there, there, there is that thing going on. But you know what's missing? This. This is what Jesus brought down, started in the fire, came down the mountain, and he said, here's what I want you to know. This is how the world will change. This is what real love looks like. And only Jesus could have brought it because it's brilliant. And when we do this, when we see the value in those things, and when we're wary of the other things, God can make us real people who love each other more and who love him more. You know, there, there is nothing that we can do really outside of community that we, to get the fullness of life. Um, I am in the season of my life where we're an empty nester, we're not an empty nester, we're an empty nester, we're not an empty nester. Right? And so now we're not an empty nester for a while. And so Mike comes upstairs and goes, Dad, I gotta show you this, Mom, Dad, I gotta show you this. And usually what it is, is some, you've seen these fail videos where people, you know, do, and you just see it coming and you think, oh no, stupid. And pff, sure enough, it's stupid, right? And they crash, they do stuff. And we have the same conversation all the time. I think he goes, I can't watch this. <laughs> this is terrible, right? You know the guy is, I says, you know, yeah. And then Mike and I watch it, we go, do it again. This time, do it in slow motion. <laughs> ah! Right? And we can do something together because we have a shared experience that we cannot appreciate when we're doing it by ourselves. Some of you are not tracking with me at all, right? <laughs> Let me try another one. You hear a piece of music or you see a piece of art and you look at it and you appreciate it and it's good. I think that you can't fully appreciate that because you know what you want to do? Hey, would you listen to this song? Hey, would you, I heard this great song. Derek sang this amazing worship song. Did you hear that? And when we share it with each other, there's this amazing thing that happens. I had a friend of mine, some I told you this, who uh, he was in the local mall, signed, put a, bought a ticket, won a brand new car. 
He said it, the, the experience in the mall was one of the worst experiences of his life. I said, seriously, what? He says, everybody there wanted to win the car, and I won it, and they were all sitting at me going. He said, it was so weird. And I got home, and it was like, yes! And I know I'm going to go off camera here, but that's okay. Yahoo! Woo! Woo! Family! Yeah! Oh, come on, come on, come on. Woo! And they were were screaming and yelling and hollering, and everybody was super excited. He won a car! (laughs) Do you understand that God has hardwired you to be in community? And and it isn't even just super spiritual stuff. Do you know what's happening as a human being when everybody gets together and the bombers score a touchdown and you're with these people and you scream and holler? There is something that's happening inside of you that God intended to happen. You would have a shared experience when you say the same things that other people say. God hardwired you for that. You are built for community. And you actually can't experience it outside of people together. You know, one of the the best examples of this was uh, my wife's spiritual parents. They're just, they're just beautiful, beautiful people. Led my, my, my mother-in-law to the Lord. She died. Took it, look after my mom. Put her, took her into the home as a kind of caring for her, loving for her, doing all this thing. Dad was out a uh, job far away. And at the end of it, I came on like way later, like 20 years after, just about. And uh, I, I met this couple for the first time, and she's, oh, you got to see the Goulds. They're like this most amazing couple. And I was, you know how you get those pictures in your mind of people. And, and I remember sitting down, and this guy, after years of practice, sat down, pulled his glasses down like this, crossed his arms, and I thought, wow, is he like settling in for a nap or what? His wife took a breath and talked for three hours straight. <laughs> Boom. And I thought, oh, now I understand. <laughs> so what else you? And she just went on. She had a lot of friends, so when she got one, boy, boom, she just went for it. And uh, I thought, wow, Eileen, how do you, like, this is, hmm. And she said, yeah, you know what, though? These people saved my life. Ooh, sorry. She was instrumental in saving uh, my mother-in-law. They loved her. They did all sorts of stuff for her after her mom died. Um, and I, I thought one of the fun ones is my mother-in-law was, was released from a bunch of addictions and tough stuff and was this beautiful, glorious lady before she died. And uh, he was looking after her car. Mr. Gould was looking after her car. And he was clean. He had fixed it up and he decided to clean the inside. And he was cleaning the inside of the windshield. And those of you who have ever smoked or been with a smoker, there's a certain layer that gets on there. And he goes, oh. He says, it's like somebody smokes in here. And she went, oh. (laughs) You know, God immediately took away the kind of gambling, drinking, all this other stuff. But she actually smoked till the day she died. Here's the thing. You know what? Mr. Gould wasn't a dummy. He actually knew that she did. But you know what he did? He had grace for her. And in that time, in the conservative church, there was like drinking, dancing, and hell, and cigarettes. That was like... You know, there is something incredible that God has put together when we get together in community. And it starts with, do you love me more? I'm going to run through one more thing with you, and then I want to give you a chance to respond and ask God what your question is. The the power of love, Jesus says, as I have loved you, a new command I give to you that you would love one another. And then he says this. As I have loved you, that you may also love one another. And and those words, as I have loved you, we could miss those, but I want you to think about this. He was talking to these 12 disciples, and what he said to the 12 disciples is, the way I loved you, 
This is what I want you to do. And what he did is he took it away from, from religion, which was temple, sacrifice, all that other stuff was their religion. And he said, here's what I want you to do. This is the new thing. Forget all that other stuff. The new command is this, love like I loved you. He ties everything to himself. And for the disciples, it would be like this. Um, Nathaniel would remember that when he came walking toward him, Jesus pointed to him and said, you know what? In that man, there's no guile or no deceit. Do you think Nathaniel was a perfect man? Do you think there never was anything bad in him? Of course not. What do you think Nathaniel remembered about Jesus? That Jesus saw the good parts of him and called out the good part. That's exactly what God does in you and me. He just looks at you and he calls out the good stuff. He could spend all day talking about your bad stuff. But he doesn't do that. He says, so what I want to do is I want you to love like I loved you. And for each disciple, there was a story that he had. I, I think Thomas would be the one that is, is really interesting to me because Thomas didn't want to let himself believe that Jesus was alive. He didn't actually see it. I know he gets a bad rap, but he didn't actually see it. And so Jesus walks up to him and he says, hey, Tom, would you come here? I, I want you to, like, did he correct him? Sure. But he met him right where he was at. He says, you know, this must be some kind of ghost or something. He says, no, Tom, just actually put your hand right where the nails went. You know, it's really good if you believe and you don't see it. But Thomas, I'm going to give you a chance to come and touch the hands that died on the cross for you. Thomas understood what real love was. Every one of the disciples had a story like that. So when Jesus says, I want to love you, I want you to love like I love they absolutely knew what he was saying. They knew that he was in that place. And uh, that was the method, that the power that God gave to them. The last thought is this. I know I said that was my last thought, but it's actually not. <laughs> There's a process to love. And Romans 15, 13 is in the message paraphrase, and it says this. Those of, who, those of you who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter. And not just what is most convenient for us. Strength is for service. Did you get that? Not status. Each of us needs to look after the good of people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? That's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself, avoiding people's troubles, but waded right in and helped out. He says, the scripture says it this way, I took on the troubles of the troubled. There is, there is a picture that, that, that is sort of impressed on our minds, and I'm not sure if you've seen it this way before. When Jesus is dying on the cross, and all the sins of the world are laid on him, he's just been beaten and brutalized. God has turned his back on him for the first time in the history of his relationship and connection with him. Everything is weighing upon him, and he's at the cross, and he does things that you would never think, and, and these are, I think, a model for us. He's dying on the cross, and he hears the thieves having a conversation, and in the middle of all of that pain, he looks over and he says to this guy, you're gonna be with me in paradise. And he's in the middle of the most excruciation torment that any human has ever had, right? He looks around to the people around him, and he says, Father, forgive them. They actually don't know what they're doing. And with all of the world's weight on him, he looks at his earthly mother and his best friend, and he says, this is now your mother, this is now your son. Do you love me more? Means that God is gonna give you the capacity, even when you're in pain, to help meet the pain of other people, even when you are in need to help meet the needs of other people around you, to be that thing, because that's what Jesus did for you. As you have been loved, so love. Amen? Amen. Amen.
I want you to just remain where you are and we're gonna spend some time. Derek, do you wanna come up and play? We're gonna spend some time asking God, what's your question for me? I've talked about love, but there may be other questions that, that are, are coming that God wants to talk to you because this is personal. And whether it's right now in these few moments or whether it's as you take some time later to do it, we want to do that. Father, would you just come and uh, we know you have those better questions for us that absolutely bring real life. And it isn't how much money am I going to make this year? And it might not even be, is my health going to be okay? There's actually a deeper question. God, would you speak to us in this moment? What's the better question? Stay in that attitude of worship. I believe somebody heard the words, what's extraordinary about you? And you're thinking that's not actually the better question. It actually is. God wants you to think about that because he made you extraordinary. Lord, I thank you that as we present ourselves to you, as we take our eyes off of ourselves, uh, that there is something that you are, a path that you are laying before us. Uh, God, would you give us the courage to engage in those better questions and, and not to get anesthetized by life and just sort of fall into the, the everyday. God, we wanna be, we've committed ourselves to be fully committed followers of you and that means engaging in those deeper questions. Thank you, Lord, that you love us that much. Here's how I want to close like we always do. And whether you're online or in the building, if everybody uh, here, just bow your heads and close your eyes. Uh, if you need to make that decision today to the really big question, and that is, do you, will you choose to follow Jesus for the rest of your life, to make him Lord, to give him leadership, Maybe you've done that in the past, but you've just sort of completely put it away. Either way, if that's you, online, there's a hand popping up. You can press on that in the building. Is there anyone here today? Just raise your hand. Say, I need to do that. I need to make that decision today. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, everybody, let's just say this together, and this is a prayer of, of that commitment. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for that extraordinary love. I choose to accept it. I choose to give you leadership of my life. I choose to engage in the better questions. I thank you for those right paths that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand?